Thank you. So it's estimated that research output globally doubles every nine years. In 2016, there were 2.3 million <coughs> research papers published. Last year, if you submitted a paper to the journal Pediatrics and Child Health, you had a less than 32% chance of getting that paper published in that journal. Getting published is really hard. Not that that's a surprise to anyone in this room, but you have a lot more control than you might think. So that's one of our main messages, right? Getting published is really hard, but you have more control than you might think. So getting published needs a ton of common sense stuff. You need a catch <coughs> title, you need to use the correct grammar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll be pleased to hear we're not going to talk about any mm. of that stuff. Um, we're both authors, as it turns out, in one way or another. Julia is a very experienced publisher. I uh, have a role, it's a number of editor roles, and I'm a general pediatrician like Sarah, who sort of found myself doing a few other things along the way. And so what we're going to tell you just in the next 15 minutes or so is the half dozen things we've learned over the years that uh, we think are going to get you published or help get you published, make it easier, or if you've already been published, to make the most of that opportunity. And we put together uh, just a one-page website, jpchonline.com slash how to get published, um, which has the slides from today, some of our key messages, some links and things as well. And in about five minutes, you know, assuming the te technology is working, we'll be tweeting out um, the slides as we go. So, you know, wish, wish us luck. <laughs> um, but to get started, Julia, why don't you take them through the, the summary? Sure. So the really big message that we want you to walk away with today is that we're all in this together. Right? Literally nothing can happen without you guys as authors doing the research and writing it up. But then there's a really important role that editors play in reviewing that research, accepting that research, curating that research into journal issues and volumes. And then we as the publishers do a lot in the background to make sure the infrastructure is there to disseminate your research to as wide an audience as possible. So we're all in this together working really hard to try to change the world. And the first thing that we're going to talk to you is a little bit about <coughs> being an author. And I'm going to leave that to Chris, because he's a lot more experienced in that than I do. So, right, authors create quality research. So most of you are hoping to be are already authors, right? And I've thought this for a long time, but it sort of fits with the conference theme as well, which is, I think, why the organizers chose it. Like, a, a research article is like a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? It has a premise. The research article premise might be something like, you know, adult technologies can be applied to children. A story might have a premise like, I don't know, uh, wizards live amongst us and their children go to boarding school, right, to name a famous example. Stories are driven by their characters. Research articles are driven by the methodology, but they both build towards the results, the climax, and then there's a conclusion. And that might sound a little far-fetched, but I, I give you this. This is the case study that starts the Harry Potter <laughs> series, right? Lord Voldemort, a.k.a. Tom Riddle, he tried to apply an adult technology to a baby, expecting it to work the same way, and it didn't. A good story might entertain us or give us a different way of looking at things or provide a different perspective, but a great story can change the way you live your life. And it goes without saying that great research is the same. So the second or third message for you is don't waste your time on anything less than a great story. Babies are welcome. Don't take the baby away. <laughs> it's a safe place for babies. <laughs> he can ask a question later, actually. So don't waste your time on anything less than a great story. Right? Do research that matters, that matters to you, that matters to other people. I know from personal experience, right, I have two papers. I've spent dozens of hours on these papers, and I'm pretty sure they're never going to be published because one was rejected by my preferred journal and the other one's kind of stuck with a co-author situation. And it turns out at the end of the day, I, I probably don't care enough about the stories that these papers are telling to, like, suck it up and go through the pain of getting them out there. And I should have known that a lot longer ago, right, before I'd put all these hours into it. So tell great stories. Do research that matters to you. 
So, Julia, let's say I've got my story there, and it's a great story, and it matters to me, and I think it might matter to others. What normally happens then is I try and pick a journal, right? That's right. So how on earth do I do that? It's a very good question. There are nearly 30,000 scientific journals out there, so how are you supposed to pick the right one? Which one's the right one, the perfect one for your piece of research? One way to start is to look at the journals that you read and the journals that you regularly cite. Those are probably good journals for this piece of research. Another great way is, which journals did you cite in this paper? Probably those journals are going to be relevant for this piece of research. You want to look at things like, are they listed in the Medline database? Do they have an impact factor? Um, one of the most important things, though, is you really need to make sure that you're not submitting to a predatory journal. So a predatory journal is going to do nothing to help the credibility or the dissemination of your really valuable research. I could tell you a million ways that you might be able to recognize a predatory journal, but instead I'm going to just direct you to this website. ThinkCheckSubmit.org is an independent organization. It's not affiliated with any publisher or any other company. But what they do is just provide a lot of resources to help you go through the process of asking the right questions to determine if a journal is predatory or not before you click Submit. So remember how we said that getting published is hard, but you're in control. Remember, you pick the journal. The journal doesn't pick you. And so this is the first and second, well, second most important place mm -hmm. that you're in control after picking a good story. So let's talk about what a journal, what editors offer you, right? And to me, it's all about credibility. And they do that in two ways. So first, there's editorial decisions that a journal makes. So what goes around your research? What are the other articles in the journal? What's the journal brand? That can lend you a sort of immediate credibility with, with some people. All of us, I guess. <laughs> the, the second thing is about peer review. I don't know about you, Sarah, but I think peer review sucks. It's so hard, <laughs> and I believe in it, right? It has a noble aim. We need peer review. It's not perfect, admittedly, but it's, it's still got a noble aim. So I dread peer review. The thing I wanted to share with you that I learned is that peer review is a conversation. So the first few papers I put out there, I thought peer review was this kind of hazing ritual where strangers would say mean things about my research, and then I would agree with all the things, make the changes they demanded in order to increase my chance of being accepted. And then it came to a point where I happened to be editing a section of a GP journal, and I got this great research uh, paper. It wasn't just it was a paper, it was just a paper for the journal. And, and then this peer reviewer came back with all of these comments, and the author simply said this. I had never seen this before, and I had no idea that this was an acceptable response to peer review. <laughs> and the author had addressed every single one of the comments and had rebutted them in a way that left it up to me to decide what to do. And in point of fact, the author, in my opinion, was right. And I accepted the paper without any of the changes. So peer review is a conversation. If you think that a peer reviewer has said something you don't agree with or that is flagrantly wrong or you prefer it a different way, then put your case in the response. The editor will sort out your disagreements. The second thing that I don't think we talk about enough is that rejection is the price of admission. We just don't talk about it enough. We always see the incredible internationally renowned PhD. Would you mind if I ask you, Sarah, have you ever been rejected? Or, or? Major, major revisions, which is almost worse? Uh, I will confess that I haven't published much. I've published small numbers, but you know. That's a good way to avoid rejection, <laughs> I guess. I, was gonna, I said to Chris, don't ask me that question, because I've only published one. So it turns out on this stage, either, so. I'm the only person who's been rejected. <laughs> but I'm not the only person in the world. I know that for a fact. Now, I've been rejected by journals that I work for, and I've been rejected by journals I've barely even heard of. Um, but... You know, I think we should say that out loud and share that for those of us, uh, you know, who are in the area, because it can be very demoralizing, and you mustn't let it get you down. You must keep trying. And if you go to the website I showed you, jpchonline.com/slash/how-to-get-published, there's a link there to this uh, colleague of mine. His name's Nick Hopwood. He's an associate professor, very eminent, you know, widely published, tons of grant money, and so on and so forth. But in his office, he has a wall with all the like the most brutal rejections. It's called his wall of rejection, and anyone who walks in can see it. And and like this is not stuff from the 80s. This is stuff from last 
last year. Right? Horrible things people say about his grant applications. And it's incredibly reassuring and inspiring. So I recommend you go and check that out. I've been rejected for a thousand grants. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, Julia, let's say, you know, let's say I've got my great story, I've made it into a journal, and I've survived peer review, blood and sweat dripping off me, but I'm there. This is the point that I see a lot of authors, I hear a lot of authors think, well, the work is done, right? We're, we're done. I don't need anything else. And there can be a little bit of grumbling, maybe on, you know, one of our esteemed discussion platforms like Twitter, about, you know, what's the role of a publisher? Now, I get to see a lot of what publishers do, which is great, but why don't you tell us what you think you do? Sure. So uh, the first kinds of things that we do that you would be involved in are, are really obvious. You as an author see those, right? And that's the copy editing and the proofreading and the proof corrections that you return to the publisher, the publishing online and in print and dissemination, all of that you see, and that's really obvious, you know, the, the kind of value that a publisher can add there. But there's a lot happening behind the scenes and beyond that where the, the publisher really does come into play. And one of those is around technology. So publishers work really closely with Google and, and other search engines. Other search engines. <laughs> um, so Yahoo to be... You know, Yahoo, Google. I suppose. Um, to make sure that their you know, web crawlers are able to crawl your content effectively, to make it really <laughs> discoverable. Then we do all kinds of archiving of your work, right? Archiving into institutional repositories, into dark archives to make sure that your work will survive the end of the world. It really will. Um, and then we do lots of work in terms of administrative things that then you don't need to worry about, right? All those forms that you sign before you publish a paper with a publisher, that means we can, on your behalf, look after all of the permissions, that, and, permissions and rights requests, copyright, look after any legal issues that crop up, plagiarism, all of those things are a huge administrative burden that we really want and love to take off of your shoulders so you can get back out there and do some more research and do the things that you actually love to do. This is how I see it, right? This is a pitch for the system working together. If you're a researcher, even if you're a brilliant researcher doing great research, if that hasn't been peer reviewed and it hasn't been edited, I don't see the difference between you and Kanye. You're just out there saying whatever you think. And that's totally like not a diss to Kanye, right? No one is better than anyone. That, I agree with that. Right? That's not credible, disseminated, peer-reviewed research. That's just an opinion. The thing is, if you're a journal without a researcher, that's just like a pamphlet full of people who are hoping to be eminent. Right? We need researchers. And if you're a publisher without <coughs> researchers and editors, well, to me, that makes you BuzzFeed. Right? If you want to get high-quality, life-changing research in front of the maximum number of people now and in the future, we need authors, editors, and publishers to work together in whatever model that may be. We're all on the same team. So, getting published is hard. Right? You have more control than you think. You pick the topic, you, pick the, you write the article, you choose the journal, you respond to peer review. You do some things afterwards about sharing your research. We're going to talk about it in a second. And we're all in this together. That's why Julia and I went to all the effort of standing up here together. And it wasn't that easy, really. We like, live in different parts of the country. The thing is, getting published isn't enough. Getting published isn't enough. You should be out there sharing your research. Now, Sarah is a total rock star, iconic role model in this regard, right? I am not. I, before I started you know, doing this talk six months ago, I'd never shared a piece of research that I'd published. I was too scared. I didn't know if people would tear me apart in you know, post-publication review, if it was okay in terms of copyright, all sorts of stuff. And the thing that I've learned on my journey, uh, doing the things that I do, is that actually you can share your research much more widely than you would think. So why is it that once I'm published, I feel like I lose control of that, right? There's, I sign the forms, you take care of all this stuff for me, but, but it's not mine anymore. That's untrue. Right. And I'm very happy that I get a chance to tell all of you this. Your research is and remains your research, right? That paper that you wrote up of your research that you submitted to a journal, that is yours forever. You can do whatever you want with it. You can post it online, on a public website. You can share it with colleagues. You can email it around. You can do whatever you want with it. Once it's accepted by a journal and it goes through all the steps of publication, peer review, formatting, typesetting, publication in XML and PDF, 
and it's in its accepted version of record, published, you can still share it. There are some limitations, but you are still able to share it online in private research groups. You're still able to email PDF copies of it to your colleagues, to your patients, to anyone involved in your study. You're still able to use it for teaching purposes and course packs, and of course you can always use it in any grant applications. You can also always link to that version from anywhere you like, and we highly encourage you to do that. The more links point to your paper, the more discoverable it is. So share your research, right? Share your research. For those of you who have already published, Sarah's doing a great job. Be more like Sarah, right? That's actually <laughs> probably applicable in most things in life, I, yep. I gather. And that we actually have some really good guidelines on the website. Right. That's right. So go to the website. Um, we just put up one major publisher's guidelines, but they're, they're common everywhere. And it says, what can you can do with what you know, version of your accepted or uh, submitted paperwork? And, and I learned a lot just by reading it, so go and check it out. Okay, so I hope that we've enlightened some things and, and made some things clearer, but we know the system isn't perfect, right? It's not perfect. There are a lot of questions, there are a lot of conversations that are happening right now, and of course it's not perfect. You're out there doing 21st century research, and then you're going back to your office and you're writing it up with 20th century technology, then you're sending it off to a publisher to be published in a format that is essentially unchanged for 350 years. This is not great, it can be so much better. But the only way it's going to be better is if we keep having this conversation, we realize that we're in this together, and that we, we actually do work together to change the world. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm. Now, we'll just check on Twitter, because we do have some questions. So generally on Twitter, um, th th we've got the, the website that you recommended for, for assessing predatory journals and also just personally didn't realise they were out there, so that's good to oh. know. Yeah, yes. mm. great. Good to know. <laughs> I saw you nodding though, Sarah, so you knew about them. Oh, yeah, so... Yeah, so once you publish, you start to get thousands of mm. unsolicited emails. That's it's basically spam, but it's bas it's you know come and speak to our conference, speak at our conference in France. It'll be fantastic, mm. and pay us a thousand dollars to come and speak at our conference in France. And and similarly with journal articles, come you know, it, it usually starts with you know esteemed madam, come and speak at this uh, or come and submit to our journal. Um, and I've never clicked I don't know as I said I haven't published much I don't have much to submit to them <laughs> um, you know I get them from geriatrics oh, yeah. um, mm. papers and obesity papers. obesity that's the latest one yeah I'm mm -hmm. being invited to be on the eminent board of a few obesity yeah journals. every now and then there's one about fluids or pediatrics and I think is this real no, no. Um, so if it's unsolicited <laughs> and and it's as soon as I think I think it's because your email is attached yeah. to um, when you're a lead author your email will be attached to a paper and it just must go out in onto some Big share thing. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Is it on? Oh, it's just a follow up. So that's how do you make huh. that stop? Is the question. You've seen my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. No, I just delete them. Or don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, there's a balance, right? Because actually, it's really important to be able to contact lead, lead authors. Yeah. Right, so just make sure you don't put like a personal email address down. That's a trap for young players. I have been victim of. Put a work email address down, right? When you log on to your manuscript central or whatever. Yeah, mm. yeah. perfect. I think uh, Sonia Twig also summed it up nicely. Um, all the sessions, in fact, we are all in this together. Nothing can happen without authors doing the research, editors curating the research, publishers ensuring that the infrastructure is there to disseminate the research. So I liked. That Perfect. summary. Yeah. Also and known as Kanye was right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one is better than anyone else. Go Correct. And um, the question we've got, um, and this is for the whole panel, so we can pass it round. And then I've got one specifically for Dr. McNabb. So um, any specific advice or suggestions for those trying to conduct research in a rural or regional area, no local ethics committee, smaller patient numbers, which is making the site less attractive for multi-centre studies? Oh, I can answer that. 
So my latest research thing, and I want to talk to a lot of people in the room about this. Um, well, I, I mean, the, the short answer is I think it's a it's a good idea to try and contact larger centres. I think mm -hmm. as, um, I agree. Sorry. Kelly was saying before, um, and try and leverage off other people. Um, a quick plug for my latest research idea, which is an inpatient general paediatric research network, um, not dissimilar to PREDICT. I, I think there's a huge gap for that in our country and across New Zealand as well. So um, I'm trying to make it happen. So anyone who uh, is interested in that specifically, come and speak to me. I don't care how rural you are. I'm interested in collaboration. And I think um, for paediatrics is a very small field when you compare to adult medicine and general paediatrics because of the variety of things that we see. A single centre, it's actually hard to get a good, decent clinical trial up and running. So, so collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. No answers for that question. Yeah, no, I think, uh, do you know that in New South Wales we've got a, you know, a group of non-tertiary peds units you should come and talk to? I'll come <laughs> and speak to you. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was just going to quickly add, some of our studies were actually specifically looking for the regional and remote facilities. So we've got a study going on at the minute looking at head injury rules. And we're, you know, we've got regional and remote facilities because we certainly can't write a new head injury rule if we don't factor them in. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so you're not overlooked. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Just give me a microphone. No, I think it's something <laughs> like 70% of the patients we see are outside of the tertiary centres. So, yeah. so it's, mm -hmm. if we're not including the non-tertiary centres, then we're really missing um, really important information. Most, 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 most of, of patients. our patients. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, do you have a brand? Not yet. We're, we're very well, early days. This is where I brand. talk about getting people involved early. I've right. learnt my lesson. Maybe you can tweet <laughs> us brand suggestions for yes. the new research yeah. network. Titles, acronyms. I love an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> Can you get supervision? The question was, um, can you get supervision if you're in a regional centre? I, I mean, it's it's difficult. It, it is. There's no doubt that it's difficult. But I think you can. I don't see why you can't um, via, you know, via technological things like Skype and emails and, and occasional face-to-face -face meetings. I think there's great value in it. But there's no reason why you shouldn't. I mean, to pick up a, yeah. um, a on one of Kelly's points... Um, so I am doing a multi-centre research study in non-tertiary units in Sydney. The thing that's the most compelling if someone from a non-tertiary centre wants to join is that they, they can do things, right? So you mentioned sort of site-specific ethics, right? So this means you might have a big ethics committee that have approved the study in general, but your particular hospital has to approve that it's done there. And that's just, you know, not quite as painful, but pretty painful. Um, and so if you've got a centre like, I'm happy to figure out how to do my site-specific ethics, that to me is like a big barrier. If you can do that, then you're going to be invested and do stuff. If you're just looking to be a co-investigator in a bigger study, but, you know, that's sort of, to me, um, like a, a bar to jump over. What do you think, mm -hmm. Kelly? Yeah, no, I agree, yeah. definitely. Um, another thing from the Twitter sphere is a very awesome doodle by Laura Sutherland. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're essentially mind maps drawn throughout the lecture. And I think it's really interesting to see how people sort of compartmentalise and, and interpret the lectures. So for those of you who are on Twitter, check it out. And if someone's not and wants to know how to get mm. onto Twitter, feel free to approach me or any of the other conveners um, and get some advice. We've got a question again from Eunice, and this is in terms of sort of work-life balance with family. So she's got three boys, eight, six and two, um, and is looking for some insights and advice on work-life and family balance so she can try and finish her PhD before her <laughs> oldest graduates from high school. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm happy. I mean, my boys are seven, five and two, so we should have a coffee. Um, oh, I don't... I would, Advice, advice. It's really hard. It's hard. Um, it's, uh, uh, yes, you have to prioritise, um, as I said, outsource, you know, if you can. And I know that we're not, not everyone's in a position where they can, but if you can, you know, pay for a cleaner or pay, at the moment I have someone delivering meals to my house. Um, I, I, you know, if you can pay for someone to look after your children or if you've got family support around you. I, I think the start of my acknowledgement of um, 
my thesis was, you know, it takes a, you know, the, everyone knows the saying, it takes a village to, to raise a child, but it takes a village to raise your children and your thesis, you know. Mm. I think I was more eloquent than that. Um, but it's, you just need to really use all of the support around you. I mean, I'm assuming we're all clinical in the room. It's, it is similar. It's, it's really hard to be medical and have a family and it's hard to do research and be medical and have a family. Um, you know, I've, I've got a supportive p partner, which I'm, I'm fortunate to have, but just use every single resource around you. And I think a, a little bit of it comes back to my little meerkat thing, so know when you work best. So, you know, if that's at night when kids are in bed or, um, you know, in the morning, but or, you know, in the morning before they get up or, or all of those sorts of things. But don't be... You know, these things take time. As I said, I, I'm not sure I would have done a PhD if I'd known it would take me six years. Three years seemed really daunting. But I took time off for the kids. I went part-time. I did enough clinical along the way that I felt like I wasn't de-skilling too much. But um, this is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And, you know, it's OK just to chip away slowly at it. I have a little bit of advice. So I, I work full time too, and I'm doing a PhD and have an eight year old. But one suggestion in terms of your grants think how you can spend your research dollar wisely. So, so we have some absolutely fantastic admin offices that don't cost as much as a clinical nurse to enter data. Do you need a clinical nurse? to just read a chart and enter data for you. So, you know, when, you, when you're needing help, just be smart with it. Think, actually, I can buy out, you know, another 100 hours of time by that admin officer that's actually a third-year student nurse that can navigate the medical chart really well. And one thing that we've done, too, is support um, summer um, observerships with um, medical students from the university. They're literally free help. Granted, they need onboarding and support, um, but, it, you know, it's really beneficial for them. They learn heaps. Some of them have never even looked in a medical chart. Um, but by the end of their um, observership period, you know, it's a win-win it's a for everyone. So just be smart. And I just wanted to make a comment. So I've got my kids are seven, five and one. Uh, this is maybe generalisation, so only if it applies to you. But I see, like, in paediatrics, of course, more than half the workforce are women, the most incredible, inspiring pe people who I like, look up to and want to be like. And um, a lot of it comes back to how, you know, their sort of conversation with me is how can they do more better? And I think it's perfectly acceptable to insist that your partner, whoever he or she is, invest in your PhD, invest in your career. That is a very reasonable expectation and something that um, I think we're slowly having conversations about, and this is probably a friendly audience to have to, to say that to, but still, like, have a, you know, if we think about uh, Warwick's um, uh, plenary this morning, like, have a difficult conversation with your partner. Like, what are you doing to support me in my career? And, and if I'm going to chip away at my career over six years, show me how you're chipping away at your career in a way that's balanced rather than you being always the golden child or the person who's, you know, progressing unfettered. So I think, that, you know, there's... Um, I mean, as a, as a father, I'd just like to put out there. I think that's excellent advice. I think that's mm -hmm. brilliant <laughs> advice. Yeah. Um, unless we have... Do we have any other questions? Oh, we do? Would you mind moving to the mic? Or at least grabbing this one yeah, on the way past? Yeah. Thanks, guys. I really learned something from all of your talks, so thank you very much. I'm wondering what you think about the sort of change to publishing in open access journals and having to pay a fee as an author for that. Um, obviously, there's pros of having everybody able to freely access your article. Um, maybe a situation that I could use to highlight that is I've got an article that might get into a f journal for free but probably will need lots of revisions. And I think the feeling is that I could probably submit it to something like BMC Paediatrics Open and pay $2,000 and they'll probably just publish it. That the standard is a little bit lower. <coughs> maybe that's a misconception from our team and I'm keen to hear all of your perspectives briefly on that, mm -hmm. if possible. Well, shall I start? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your question about the quality, perception of quality, is a really interesting one. So I'm going to start there. There is this myth that open access means lesser, less rigorous peer review and lesser quality in general. A lot of that's perpetuated because predatory journals are almost always open access, but not all open access journals are predatory. <laughs> right? So like you say, BMC, you know, PLAS, those journals are good quality journals, but often the 
criteria for acceptance in, in those journals is <coughs> quality, methodology, scientifically sound research, right? As opposed to novelty. There are, however, open access journals that do still have those same criteria of novelty. What does this add to the literature? Additionally, almost all traditional journals now have the option to pay open access, and those, you know, there's no, different, no difference in the peer review standards there, and in fact, no reviewers are aware of whether or not this paper would be open access or not. So there's some things there, and that's a question of just looking at, I suppose, the journal, reading the research, seeing what you actually think about it before you submit to that. Um, your other question, I suppose, is about, is it okay for people to pay, you know, what do, how do I feel about that? Is that reasonable? Have I answered your question? All right, then we'll leave it at that. Could, could I add a my two cents, which is yeah. uh, kind of like a parenting advice and research advice, and it's always okay to lower your standards. Is that controversial? <laughs> <laughs> Really? <laughs> it's not always okay to lower your standards, but sometimes it's okay to lower your standards. Uh, uh, so I would love for all my research to be published in, uh, you know, Nature or JAMA or Archives or whatever. And it's just not, it's not good enough. It's not that it's not important. It still matters to me. It's going to matter to other people. It's good research, but it doesn't meet the novelty criteria or the size or whatever. So, uh, you know, one of my journeys is about, you know, just finding less prestigious journals that have high standards and good quality, but that will accept my papers. I don't pay for them to be published, but you know, it's like... Mm -hmm. We've got, we do have another question? Yeah, take the microphone. We do have time for just this final one. Thank you. Um, a lovely session. I wanted to just touch on peer review because in your All In It Together, the gap to me that was in there was peer review, and I speak as both a general paediatrician and a basic science researcher and an editor. And the biggest issue I have is with peer review because to get good peer review, I like to send it to people I know are very credible in their area and maybe my networks aren't expanded enough, almost always there's far more rejections from peer reviewers than there are from even my submissions. So mm -hmm. the, I don't know if you have advice about how to get people to engage in peer review, because everybody is always too busy or travelling or would like to think it's not in their area, and also how we get the message across that feedback is not by definition negative and that peer review is not by definition critical even though it is critique and that sometimes papers are good enough to be accepted actually so I'd just value any closing Can I comments start? you have on that. Yeah. So, um, so I would just answer that very simply by saying I think that if you imagine, so we know on average peer review takes three hours, three to four hours per accepted paper per reviewer and most papers have two reviewers say at a minimum, some have more. So then I think it's very simple if you submit a paper you have a moral obligation to review papers, mm -hmm. right? Someone has invested in your paper, you have an obligation to invest in others. And there will be some onboarding, to use your phrase, so, you know, learning how to do that. But if you're good enough to, to submit, then you're good enough to peer review and you should be doing it. Um, that's the simple answer to that. And uh, it's true, it's really hard to find peer reviewers uh, because it's, you know, um, in fact, the publishers are doing something a bit interesting where you can now get credit for the, you know, articles you write, something called Publons, which is for the first time can give you some credit for peer reviewing papers, which has really been missing. We used to do it all in our free time. No one could ever tell if you'd done it or not, certainly not your employer. Um, so that's quite useful, but uh, that's, that's my bit. Yeah. Can I just yeah. add on to that quickly? So you know, not being in the, in the research and peer reviewing like real life space, right, in real time, the advice that I still often give people, because I talk to a lot of editors who have this exact same problem, you're not alone, I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse <laughs> about this problem, um, but is to <sighs> encourage your colleagues to encourage their younger colleagues to be peer reviewers. So it's a really good learning opportunity for early career researchers, early career authors and, and clinicians to, you know, reviewing someone else's work is such an amazing way to learn yourself about how to write well, about what makes good science, or what, what makes a good paper. So invest maybe in the time there, and that maybe will, over time, help build up the, the global sort of database of reviewers. Um, as, as a peer reviewer and not an editor, um, I, I get asked to do do some peer reviewing. I've never been taught how to do it. 
I think. Mm. Um, the, do you know how I've learnt to do it? Is by reading the other peer reviewers because once you've yeah, peer reviewed, okay. they send you back all the responses. I was like, the first time I reckon I wrote five pages and someone wrote back half a page and went, oh, that's how you do it, you know. So I actually think, and I, I certainly have colleagues who've come to me for advice about how to peer review and I say, well, I can tell you how I do it. Um, if I, it would be wonderful and, my, and it's probably out there and I just don't know about it, but it um, how do you train to be, you know, guidelines it for is. peer review, yeah. So it's out there. It's out there. Yeah, it's a supervisor's job, I think. Yeah. I think that's the thing, and so I'm now trying to pay it forward, but um, I'll have to look into how I'm supposed to be teaching people but, to do it. Yeah. But also that, um, you know, that the supervisors should be... It's part of the ecosystem, right? We, we all focus on the publication. Uh, and so the two things, firstly, is that no-one prepares you for peer review. Like, I'm always exhausted by the time I submit a paper, and then it comes back, you know, peer review two or three times. I've never had any energy left. So the first thing, like, leave energy for peer review. Mm. And the second thing is that if you... That makes you a researcher. People are uncomfortable, particularly clinicians, owning that sort of label. But once you're a researcher, you're part of the ecosystem. You should be contributing and not be afraid of that and having a go, right? Yeah, and I think there's... Uh, certainly what I've encountered with people is a bit of the imposter syndrome. So yeah. so if you are doing your PhD and you set, or, or research higher degree, and and publication seems like the pinnacle, that's what you're aiming towards, and then someone asks you to peer review for someone else's publication, there's a, a certainly I and a lot of other people, I mean, I could do a whole session on imposter syndrome, <laughs> but um, there's a whole lot of people who say, well, how on earth could I do this? I'm still trying to achieve this myself. Um, again, it's just jumping off, off the edge and giving it a go and... I, yeah. And remembering yeah. that editors will have to clean up. Like, if you <laughs> submit a crappy peer review... That the editor's job, right, to then either feed back to you and say, hey, that wasn't up to scratch, I'd really need you to address these issues, or just ignore you and get another one. I mean, I think that's, you know, there's a conversation to be had that doesn't you feel like there are lots of walls between everybody, but you can just chat and say, is this okay? What else did you want to know? Yeah. Would that be fair in your publication? If, if a peer reviewer gave it a go, you were trying to onboard them and hopeful they would contribute to your publication in the future and you weren't happy with what they'd written because it didn't make sense, you would say something to them? Yeah. yeah, and there are actually learning and education resources available, which um, we'll add the link to, to the website. website. Yeah, mm, great. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience too. Mm. Lots and lots of great questions. Um, and without sounding like a predatory journal, um, <laughs> can we thank our eminent? <laughs> can we thank um, our panel, um, please, Sarah, Kelly, Chris, and Julia? 